We're very excited to be joined by Steve Hansen, head uh, basketball coach at Simon Fraser University, uh, Canada's team, as they say. Uh, Steve, thank you for joining us today. Anthony, great to be with you. Awesome. Um, so let's get started with when you started playing basketball, uh, where you grew up, and, and what that was like uh, when, you, when you got started. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a quick trip down memory lane. I guess I was born in Peterborough, Ontario, and uh, we lived kind of on a hockey street. We had a, actually a, a pro player, a guy named Bob Berry, lived two doors down from us, who was a good friend of my sister and uh, good family friends. Uh, at three years old, my, my dad was working for IBM, so we, uh, he got transferred to Victoria. And uh, at that, that age, I was you know, just a youngster. Uh, but I did have skates uh, in Peterborough, so I was, the first thing I did was uh, learn how to skate at a pretty young age. But yeah, Victoria, I was there until grade two and, and uh, um, you know, multiple sports um, was kind of what my family was all about. I think my dad and mom being immigrants of England, they were, you know, tennis, hockey, soccer, you know, anything Canadian kids were doing outdoors, swimming. Uh, so that was kind of my, my, my first thing with sports was trying them all. And then when I moved to the uh, lower mainland, uh, I lived in Richmond for a year. And at that time, I think soccer, uh, I think, started to pick up a little bit. And then uh, we, we settled in Coquitlam when it was kind of a new suburb, uh, growing suburb. So, uh, yeah, I, I did it all. I think uh, football was probably the first thing I, I, I took a little more seriously. That was in uh, sixth grade. We, we played a lot of touch football in, in the park and, and uh, had a, uh, you know, a cohort of friends that were loving touch football. And then when we found out community football was uh, – was in Coquitlam, we signed up and, and that was kind of the first thing where it was uh, a little more serious, you know, getting hit and putting pads on and stuff like that. So uh, basketball for me was uh, grade eight. I mean, we played in elementary school, but it wasn't uh, as serious. I mean, I, I remember getting my first Jordans in uh, grade seven. Those, yeah, 100%. Yeah, I, I had the ones. I remember my mom complaining that, you know, shoes were $99 and, and we uh, got them on sale at Foot Locker, Coquitlam Center for $74.99. I'll never forget. So that was grade seven. And then grade eight, uh, back then, uh, the school I went to was called Hastings, which is now Maple Creek Middle School. But that was an eight to 10 school. And that was the first time, you know, real organized school sports was uh, a big part of school. So basketball, grade eight, that was kind of my first, uh, you know, started to ignite that passion in, in, in the game. Absolutely. And then, so what, what high school did you end up going to? Yeah, so in grade 10, uh, guys in my area, we had a choice between kind of, uh, sorry, Port Moody and Fox. And I'd say about a third of the, the kids in our school went to Fox, and most kids went to Port Moody. So uh, my point guard and I, Andy Wright, who's passed away now, we, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we were kind of, two serious players on our team and we had decided to go to Port Moody and then uh, you know just through some of the guys in the community because back then it was just Centennial Port Moody and Fox and we all knew each other pretty well and and Howard Samira back then used to write for the now and the news and they used to do previews of you know the junior teams back then so it was a it was a big deal junior basketball back then so um, so we, we were considering going to Moody and then my, my point guard convinced me to come with him to go to Fox and probably about three weeks before school started, we transferred to Fox when there was no transfer rules back then. We just, we, we left the balls and told the, uh, told the uh, secretary at Port Moody, take us out of the system. We're going to Poco. So. No kidding. By the yeah. way, I, I'd like to say this local newspapers, if they, if they still covered high school sports, I think people would actually read them. That's just my personal. <laughs> I don't think anybody cares about high school, about uh, these papers anymore because they don't actually give you anything relevant to look, to read. But back yeah. then, I bet you the viewership was huge. People actually cared about that stuff. They got passionate about it. But anyway, what? we won't get into that now, but so you end up yeah. going to Fox. What was your experience like at Fox? Uh, they were a, a good team back then, I would imagine. Well, not really. I mean, I think um, Fox had, uh, in 1986, they won the Fraser Valley Championships, and that was the last time they had gone to the BC. So Don Van Oss, who was my head coach, I remember him coming to Hastings and, and uh, kind of doing a recruiting sales pitch, brought all the people that were interested in basketball into a room, and he talked about it. And 
I wasn't buying what he was selling at the point at that time. But uh, there was a guy named Bobby Huckle who was from Prince George, and he was a phenomenal athlete that went to Mary Hill and ended up at Fox. And I used to see him down at my elementary school just playing hoops, and uh, he started talking to me about coming to Fox, and and so that was kind of the first connection, right? It's always about connections and relationships and and uh when i decided to go i mean i was still you know it was hard because most of my cohort of friends were at port moody and uh port moody was playing football so i ended up in grade 11 just focusing on basketball and i was really happy because when we played port moody that year we won by 27 and and uh I, you know i i realized we made a good decision so i think andy and i thought that fox team when we were in grade 11 was full of talented grade 12s so Brett Anderson, who came up to our school a year later, his older brother, Scotty, was a phenomenal shooter. Uh, he was like a 6'2 shooting guard. And we just had a good team. You know, we upset Pitt Meadows that year. That was one of the top teams. But the Fraser Valley Championship that year was uh, Centennial and, and uh, Pitt Meadows, I believe. So um, we got knocked out by John Dykstra's Chilliwack team in the Fraser Valleys, and we didn't make it to the BCs. So we were, you know, our expectation was to get back to the Agrodome, and 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 the uh, Fox team hadn't done that, and and at that point, five years. So next year was was kind of a big year. We only had four grade twelves, and we had a ton of talented grade elevens come up, and that included, uh, you know, Brett Anderson, who was the BC High School Athlete of the Year in football and basketball, and. Uh, you know, he gave us, gave us a lot of confidence. He was just a big time player, such a quiet, smooth player that uh, was so nonchalant. I think uh, after I graduated, Chambers left Centennial and, and joined up with Van Oss, and that's when they won the BCs. And I think, you know, Brett drove Chambers nuts because he was <laughs> not the most intense guy. He was just talented and very calm. So, yeah, so we, we made it back to the BCs, and, and my grade 12 year was the same year Nash, uh, Nash's team won. And they beat Pitt Meadows, who was a big rival of ours that year. And, and uh, we ended up losing in triple overtime, 90-89 to Belmont, who was the number two team from the island. And it was a crazy first game because I just remember being sick. And, you know, looking back, just being so disappointed that I played terrible and uh, fouling out in regulation and then seeing my team lose in overtime. It was uh, painful to watch. But, uh, you know, Agrodome was a lot of special memories. I just remember how cold it was, you know, smelling the manure down in the locker rooms and it just being cold. I don't know if it was a flu I had, but it was just, I just remember it being cold. It was tough to warm up, but it was uh, a lot of fun. And a lot of fun going back when I got into my early 20s to watch. And, uh, you know, the font, the next year seeing uh, Fox win, you know, it, that, that was a special thing. You know, Van Oss made us part of, feel part of a big family at Fox and coming back to watch that team win was pretty special in 93. It's funny because, you know, I, if I asked you what you did last week, you probably couldn't give me too much detail, but you're, you're going back in time and you're giving me like, it's, it's <laughs> like bang, 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 bang. And you know what? Yeah. I can do the same thing from my high school experience. So it's, it's kind of funny yeah. what sticks with you and, and how you can have memory loss, but some things you never forget. That's uh, that's a fantastic story. So what, what do you do after high school? Where, where do you do in university? What, what's the deal? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of people that know me kind of know my story. So, I mean, I, I had a serious girlfriend in, in grade 10 and 11, and, and uh, we, had, we ended up having a young son. I had given birth to a, a son when I was in 11th grade. Uh, my wife went to Port Moody in grade 11, then ended up uh, transferring to Centennial in grade 12. So, yeah, so my son AJ was born, and it, it was uh, obviously a very different time. It obviously affected everything I, I was doing, and, and my main focus was, you know, when graduating was time to get a job. <laughs> so, um, you know, back then, I think about what I my plans were. I think, you know, playing at SFU, UBC, or UVic was was pretty tough to crack that roster. I don't think I was good enough to, to play at those schools, so college was something on my mind. Uh, but BCIT and broadcasting was kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted to get into uh, broadcasting. So, uh, but yeah, those plans changed. I, I got a job. I, I ended up working in the grocery industry for, you know, what I thought was going to be three months turned into 12 years and uh, made, made a pretty good salary and, and stuff working for West uh, Westfair, which is a company that owns Superstore. So, yeah, so at that point, I mean, bought a home and, and uh, you know, my son was growing up and I thought that was it. Um, during that time, though, I was always coaching. So I, my, my first year of coaching basketball was actually 21. I went back to coach the 95-96 team. Uh, that team lost to uh, Kitsilano in the final. That was a ton of talent. 
on those two teams. And that was a, a real fun year, but I didn't know anything about basketball. I mean, I, Ben Austin Chambers just said, Hey, come back and, and just be that young guy to, uh, you know, connect with the team. But I, I didn't know anything about the game. Um, you know, I remember them trying to tell me to give a speech at halftime and it was, you know, I was put on the spot and, you know, it was just a typical Fox speech, you know, we're not playing tough enough. We're getting our ass kicked. Let's go. And, and, uh, um, you know, we, we, we had some great battles that year. It was uh, Lady Smith was really talented. Uh, Richmond, you know, uh, Kyle, Kyle Russell and Pasha Baines was a, was a 10th grader uh, on that uh, Richmond team. Um, and then Vancouver College. And then Kitsilano was uh, not as highly ranked, but they were still very good. And, and they upset some teams going to the final. And we lost, I think it was one of the lowest scoring BCs that year in 95, 96, because uh, they had a big zone with Sandy Bizarro and or Ewing. They just had so much size, and we couldn't hit a shot to save our lives playing in GM Place. And I think it was like a like a fifty four to forty two or something. It was it was a disgustingly offensively lacking final. <laughs> so, but uh, playing in GM Place was really special. Obviously, that was you know the Grizzlies' second year, I believe, in in in, in uh, Canada, and and that was a really special time in BC basketball. You know, it's funny this year at the Langley Event Center, obviously with the provincials, they did the, the historic, you know, we're going to show, show you all the different champions from all the teams uh, from the beginning. And we're going to give you like a history lesson. And it, I mean, the places the BC Boys Basketball Championship has gone um, from day one to today has been unbelievable. I mean, it, it's, it's what a, what a unique experience. And, and I think, you know, although you have a very prominent role in, in the basketball community, one of the things that I think is important is, your memories that you have that are so detailed there's thousands of guys that have just as detailed memory they can give you this course I actually I'm not a score guy but that the fact that you remember scores from 20 years ago is is thoroughly impressive but I bet you there's a bunch of guys like that and it's totally changed and impacted the game and I think it's one of the things that keeps everything going for sure yeah, I think that was, you know, a tough transition, especially for the Vancouver people going to Langley. I mean, you know, just all those memories, you don't, you don't want to lose those memories and those fun, fun times. But I mean, at Langley, just the, the newness of the facility and obviously the, uh, the electronics and the, the computer pieces that they can add with graphics and stuff has made the event outstanding. And, and uh, you know, for me, getting, going back to coach as I, you know, I took over for Chambers at Fox in uh, 2011, 2012, I mean, that uh, was a really nice way to kind of rejuvenate those, those memories and, and, and try to get a group of kids to, uh, you know, have those fond memories that I had playing, playing at the Provincials. Absolutely. Let's talk about those teams. So you had some very good teams when you coached Eric Fox. Um, you know, uh, some very talented players. I remember Ryan Slayer took over the show um, that one year and won, won the MVP. To Ryan Slater? Did I get the name right yep. there? Yep. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, he he kind of took over at the top of that zone. He was impressive. Um, talk a little bit about going back there and actually, you know, taking care of business and going and winning the championship. It's got to be an unbelievable experience. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I was coaching the junior boys the year before that, and uh, Chambers uh, got hired at UVic that year. So, in spring, I found out that he was leaving, and they asked me to take over. And at the time I was, uh, yeah, I was working full time and, and, uh, and, uh, actually at school. So I had gone back and I was, was just starting my PDP at SFU. So I was like, you know, can I handle this? And, uh, I just said, yes. I said, if I, if I say no, I'll regret it. So, uh, that summer, yeah, I took the team that summer and we had a ton of guys we had 17 guys. And from the previous year we had, I believe 10 guys returning. So, um, we weren't expected to do much um, because we had lost Brett McDonald, Matt Trimble, Scott Hind, and three really talented offensive pieces that were uh, that had lost in the semifinals to uh, R.C. Palmer, who won in 2011. So I think preseason we were ranked number nine. And, uh, you know, Walnut Grove, Pitt Meadows, those two teams were going to be big rivalries in the Valley, and Tamanowas ended up becoming a very good team that year as well. Uh, but the Fraser Valley North was tough. I mean, we had Tony Scott at Glen Eagle, uh, you know, Al Cassell coaching Centennial. That was very good. Port Moody was very good that year under Alex Devlin. Uh, but Pitt Meadows with Rich Goulet. So we just had a really tough conference that I loved always being a part of because, uh, you know, those those local rivalry, rivalries, the kids you see all the time at the park or at the drop-ins, that, that was kind of the thing with our guys. So 
but yeah, Slater was very good. He, he was a guy that moved up in 10th grade. So I, when I was coaching juniors, he, he was moved, he was moved up because of his talent. And, uh, like I said, number nine. And then the first week of the season, we played, uh, we had a heck of a week. Our, the opening week, we played Van College. They were number three. Uh, we played W.J. Mowat. They were number four. And then we played Kelowna that had Braxton Bunts and uh, Mitch Goodwin. And they were the number one team uh, preseason that year. And they came down and, and played us. And we beat all three of those teams in the first week. So we went from number nine to number one. Thanks, Howard. And uh, <laughs> Uh, needless to say, it was a great week, but uh, two weeks later, we went to uh, the island, played uh, Oak Bay, who was very strong that year. Uh, they were a top 10 team, and and St. Michael's, who was in double A, and they spanked us by 19 over there. So we went from thinking we were uh, a lunch bucket crew to being hot, and then uh, got spanked in, in, in good fox form. We uh, As soon as we thought we were good, we weren't very good. So so yeah, so that was kind of the year, and uh, you know, Walnut and us became a rivalry. But Pitt Meadows was probably the most consistent team all year long. I think they had lost two games. Uh, we lost them once in overtime at home, and then we lost by about 15 at their place. And then Walnut Grove, we had played three or four times semifinals of the Legal Beagle, um, semifinals of the Fraser Valleys, and then a couple other times in exhibition. So, and we we were close every time, but we just couldn't beat them. So. I remember in the Fraser Valley semifinal, Jaden Cohey was a 10th grader and, and probably one of the most, if not the most talented kid in the province already that year. And uh, we decided to switch our matchups. And uh, just because, you know, you, you, you played them three times, we got to do something different. And uh, those matchups were deathly wrong. <laughs> and I, I don't think they missed a shot in the first half. We were down like 15, lost by at least 20. And uh, that was a brutal semifinal loss. And then we just squeaked into the BCs because we had to beat uh, uh, one more team. And then we played, we played Tamanowis for fourth place. And uh, Tamanowis beat us in that uh, – sorry, for third place. And they beat us in that third place game. So we went as, in as a fourth seed, and we ended up playing Island number one, which was Oak Bay, a team that beat us by 19. So – but I knew, I just knew the BCs was a different, different ball game for everybody. I mean, you're playing in a neutral arena. It's a tough place to shoot. And uh, so we, we always kind of had a hell week during that week off. We kind of gave them a few days off. And then we, we kind of started from scratch and did things a little different. We kind of had a bit of a boot camp to reset us. And then we started pre preparing for Oak Bay. So we had a very good game plan and, and, and beat them in the first round. And then we ended up being matched up with Pitt Meadows, who, uh, who was the number one seed coming out of Fraser Valley in the quarterfinals. So, uh, like I said, I, we had played Goulet a hundred times. Well, it felt like a hundred times and the flex offense. So we were pretty comfortable. And if we thought we could hang in, we thought we could win. And we ended up just playing really well. We, we played well. They, they probably had their worst game of the year. And that game I remember because it was 66-33. <laughs> yeah, was I was at that game, actually. <laughs> I think I went to that game. I was like, oh, this is going to be a good one. And you guys were yeah. yeah, and it was – I felt bad for Rich because that was a team where I think he thought he could have won with that team. And, and uh, you know, as a player in high school, I couldn't stand Goulet, you know, his barking. and, and uh, But as I became a high school coach, I – uh, you know, I was able to take so much from him and, and what he's done for the sport in our province. And uh, I, re I really felt for him after that loss. So, uh, yeah, and then in the semifinals, we got matched up with White Rock Christian, uh, two very good teams. And, and by that time, we had a lot of confidence. We had, you know, our shooters were shooting really well, and we built a bit of a lead. And we almost lost it late in the game, but uh, squeaked out a four or five point win. And, and uh, that had us matched up with uh, Walnut Grove in the final. So... So again, you know, two weeks prior, we had just got spanked by Walnut Grove. And again, you know, our game plan was just to hang in and, and uh, you know, go back to our original matchups, which was having our center, you know, 6'7", Ryan Slater, guard Kohi, which was, uh, you know, kind of unorthodox, but it was the only guy that kind of was able to challenge Jaden's shots a little bit because, you know, at 6'4", six, 6'5", six, he was such a big guard and talented. So, and they had some very good shooters around. So it was a, a back and forth game. I think there was nine or 11 lead changes and we went into half up one and uh, we, you know, we were doing what we wanted, just hang in. And with two minutes left, we got down nine. And uh, that's when we thought the game was over, um, you know, 
uh, I called the timeout and never been in that situation being down nine. And, and uh, you know, we had some traps and some stuff that we did against other teams, but not against the elite teams. We didn't trap a lot. Um, but we tried to get back in the game and we caused some you know, travel violations and some turnovers. And somehow we got back into it and, and we hit a big shot with about five or six seconds left to go up one and, and uh, squeaked out an incredible win in the final. So, you know, Jaden Cohey was, you know, could have, if, if they would have won, Cohey would have been the MVP. And, and Ryan Slater for us was obviously outstanding all year. And I think the only provincial MVP that didn't go on to play basketball. So had an outstanding career of playing volleyball and play, plays volleyball in Germany now with his wife. So, so yeah, really unique time. And, and obviously that being my first year, that was incredible. But, uh, you know, Chambers worked with a lot of our grade 11s that were eventually grade 12s. And, and uh, we, had, we had a deep, talented group. So I, I, I actually used to talk to Rich all the time about that team when he was coaching. We, we coached at CP together. Um, we had a lot, of, a lot of communication. And, you know, I think his personality and his style uh, didn't gel with Ryan at all, right? Like, it just – it wasn't a thing. And then you come in there and the kid – the kid skyrocket. And he'll t he's the first to tell you that story, right? Like, it just – we weren't meant to be together. And so talk about how the personality adjustment might have allowed him to actually propel to the next level, whereas, you know, some, there's some guys that for sure played way better under Rich and, and wouldn't have necessarily played better in a more – uh, composed environment. Talk about how you talk about him specifically, Ryan Slater, and how that worked for him. And then talk specifically about how you have determined your personal coaching philosophy and style and the demeanor that you that you coach with. Yeah, I mean, I've I've learned so much from Don and Rich, and and by observing, right. But we can't we can't be those people, right? I mean, what makes Chambers special is uh, his personality, his fire, and and as much as you try to emulate it, you're never going to be Richie Chambers. So no, because he's authentic with it, right? He's it's it's him. It's legit. That's who he is, and you're not him, so you got to be you, right? So that is what it is. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah. I mean, we all bring our a different energy to the court, but with Richie, it's uh yeah. I mean, he's a five five fireball and. Uh, a ton of fun to be around um, and sometimes maybe not when you're a player but I mean uh, uh, he, he demands a lot and I think that's the biggest thing you can learn from a coach like that is you know high expectations breeds success and I think that that was the big thing so you know I just came in and, and talked about the roster with Rich and talked about some players and and listened to his perspective on Ryan so I I, I took I took what what he told me about him and, uh, you know, he was a high, he was going to center for performance for volleyball and could have done for basketball as well. Um, and we always practice on Sundays. So we, we went six days and usually had Saturdays off. And on Sundays, I remember we wanted to practice, I think, 12 to two, and he had CP from one to four. So we adjusted our practice and he would be running from volleyball, but he never complained. He was ready to go. And, and we made that small adjustment for him and just understood that he was an elite player at two sports so we made a few concessions but I mean for as much as he trained all year round doing another sport he never missed and never complained and he was an outstanding teammate so for him I just had to understand that I could get on him but maybe not to the level that I could get on a, a role player who if that player didn't bring a certain amount of energy he wasn't helping us at all whereas if Ryan you got into his head you might hurt his confidence so I, I think looking back at Ryan as a player out of all the guys I've coached, even university, he did simple things so well. Like he never missed shots that you should never miss. He never took bad shots. Um, he was a very good three-point shooter, but took very selected amount of three-point shots. And then he was an elite jumper, right? At, at six, seven, just having that quickness. I've never seen a guy steal so many balls on a baseline inbounds guarding the inbounder. Um, just his ability just to go up quick, like was incredible. So um, so I kind of understood that I got the feeling for that, but I mean, I don't think, you know, maybe Ryan will say I, I was different, but I, I don't think my coaching style, uh, was that different. I think it was just that we, we had a lunch bucket crew that felt that the three most talented guys had graduated. And I think they felt disrespected by that. And they, they wanted to prove that they were pretty good. And I really think off the court is where that group was unique. They, there's probably 10 guys that played all the time together. And uh, those guys come back and play at our alumni tournaments, all the older guys that 
are talented. They're just like, these guys aren't very good. But for some reason, this team just always hangs in. They're just that annoying team that is uh, maybe not the most talented, but they're a tough together group, right? So that says a lot of what you can do when you, when you have a group of common, uh, a bunch of guys that have a common goal. Totally. So you coached at Terry Fox for a couple of years and then opportunities at Simon open up. Tell us a little bit about that experience and what it was like. Yeah. So I, I, I was lucky to run Fox for four years. Ended up losing the finals. And then that spring, I got a phone call from Virgil Hill, who had just got hired as the SFU coach. And Virgil was a guy who I watched play at SFU. I mean, he was part of some pretty talented teams, kind of 90 to 94. And I used to go up and watch those guys and play on the weekends against the football guys and some of the guys on the team. So knew Virg well. Um, and, and the first guy I called was Richie. And I just said, you know, what do you think? And he's like, you know, you know, you're doing a great job at Fox, but if you don't take the opportunity, you may never get asked again. So uh, I said yes. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it was an outstanding experience. I mean, obviously the NCAA piece and the college piece, which, you know, you can't prepare for if you've never done it. Um, but I, I was really uh, – I just felt really lucky to be asked to do that. And I'm really appreciative to Virgil for giving me that shot because, um, like I said, you, you just never know if you don't say yes, sometimes you may never get that opportunity again. So we had a tough year. Um, you know, it's always tough as a first year coach coming in, you have some guys you didn't recruit and, and, uh, we had, a, we had a tough, tough, tough year and, and, uh, Virg ended up resigning at the end of that year. And, and, uh, then I was up to interview for the job and, and, uh, you know, we had some assistants within our league interview, and, and uh, after everything was said and done, I, I got the job. So I was very lucky um, because that, that team that I was an assistant, we were 2-18 and 18 in league and 4-24 uh, and 24 on the year. So, <laughs> so uh, again, I think, I think that connection was, with Richie was important because I'm pretty sure Teresa Hanson, my boss, called Richie about that. So, you know, uh, they, they saw some things in me that – hopefully could help this program. And, and I think that's the biggest thing looking back. It doesn't matter where you're coaching, whether it's youth basketball, club basketball, high school, university, you, you have to have high expectations and it, it's about winning a hundred percent. So, you know, I, I think that's the biggest disservice we can do for young people is sports teaches you a lot of things, but at the end of the day, the goal of sport is to win. And, and it, it's not a, a win at all cost mentality, but it is doing what it takes to win. And, and I think if you, if you have that, no matter what you teach, you're, you're, you're going to come out with some real positive things. So, you know, I've been watching a lot of uh, Carlton practice this week and, and uh, seeing, you know, some of the, 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 the talking they do. And it's really all about winning, like just winning the one-on-one -on -one battles all the time. Right. And I think all coaches do that, but just listening to that consistent message with Carlton, it really uh, stuck with me. So we're going to keep pushing the envelope on that. Well, I mean, and, and you have, so you start up, you get four wins, uh, you're taking over every year. It's been progress, right? I mean, the team is now competitive in the league. You guys are fighting for the, against the big dogs. I mean, Simon was in trouble for a long time there for a little bit. And, you know, when they left the CIS, it really wasn't a pretty situation. You've added some stability to it, but also kids are actually graduating now. Um, four kids this year, three kids last year. Talk about the process of actually keeping kids around for a long period of time and actually having them, you know, finish off the way they're supposed to at, the, at a university and graduating and actually building a tradition of kids finishing the cycle. Yeah, I think I think all high school kids that are talented, they have the dream of playing pro at one point. But at the end of the day, when they get to university, they got they they finally get to see life after basketball. What's gonna What's it gonna look like if I don't play professionally? And uh, you know, having that piece of paper, having that degree, and having uh, your basketball talents pay for that degree that's that's oh. a real special that's a real special thing. So. Yeah, I, you know, I, I always tell kids when I'm recruiting them, you're going to be better at 22, 23 than you are at 18. So just have that long-term approach. Understand that it's like kind of going into eighth or ninth grade and, and being on the varsity team. You're, you're going to get your butt kicked for a year or two. And, you know, if, you know, we've had a couple guys pretty talented come in and play a lot as freshmen, but that's pretty rare. So, um yeah, graduating kids is is a, a special thing for us. But at the same time, I mean, again, we we got to win. We're in the business of winning. So, 
Um, you know, this past year was a lot of fun. We, we, we had our first, uh, the first time we've been ranked in the West region, we, we got as high as number five. So that's out of three conferences, which is about 35 teams. Uh, so that was pretty special, but we had some injuries in January and I think we underachieved a little bit. I mean, we, we thought going into January, we were going to win the conference. We had beat the, the, the preseason number one, which was Western Washington. Uh, but our league is just so tough. I mean, the teams that no were, nights off in your league for sure. Yeah, the, the number eight or nine team. You know, we lost uh, at home on a buzzer beater uh, three uh, when we had one of our top players go down. But it was a game we thought we should win, and and all of a sudden now we're we're fighting. So so yeah, we ended up the season. I think it, we were sixteen and thirteen and had another good winning season. But again, making playoffs was really tough. And then with COVID, the West Region got canceled and. And that was it for the year. So, yeah. So, okay. So for next year, you obviously graduated some very important pieces of your team. Let's, let's get a little update on how the team looks for next year. Uh, obviously COVID, you know, this, that, and the other, blah, blah, but actual personnel. Um, you've got some older kids coming back. Your team should look pretty good. Give us a little bit of an update on how that, how that team's going to be. Yeah. So, I mean, we graduated our, our, our starting point guard who, who has started since his uh, redshirt freshman year and, and, and actually set a record in the GNAC for most minutes played and games started. So that was Mike Provenzano. So, um, but we brought in a talented uh, uh, point guard the first year this year who, who came off the bench and did really well for us, David Penny, who's from Guelph, Ontario. And, uh, you know, he's just, uh, he's a little more athletic. He's pretty fun to watch, and, uh, you know, he, he's going to do really fine. I think uh, our guys are really excited to play with him. And then with Mike graduating and David stepping up, we need another point guard. So the first guy we signed was a guy named Joven Rye, who uh, is from the Toronto Basketball Academy. His older brother plays at Dartmouth, and, uh, you know, he's an Ivy League student, um, was, you know, waiting on some Division One interest, and an offer didn't come through. So we 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 showed a lot of interest with him, and and got him to commit. And he's a big guard. He's six four. He's pretty athletic and and a high IQ player. So that's kind of nice because we've had some smaller guards, and now now we have some longer guards. And you know, David's about six two, six three. So we got a pretty good backcourt. Um, locally, we we have Hunter Cruz Demont coming up, who I'm super excited about. Um, Every time I see the kid, he's grown an inch. So uh, it reminds me a lot of his dad. His dad was a year younger. John was a year younger than me. That's what I remember about John at Bank College was he came in, I remember grade 11, like 5'11". And then by the time he graduated high school, he was like 6'4", 6 6'5". 6 and Hunter's a legit 6'4 right now. And I bet he's going to be probably 6'6 6 6 by the time he's done at SFU. So... Yeah, so those three guards coming in are going to be really good pieces, and it'll be interesting to see how they do. And, and you know, we don't decide who's going to redshirt or not. We just, you know, if they're not going to be a top nine or ten player, it makes sense to redshirt. Just, again, with that philosophy, you're going to be better as you're older. But all three of these guys, I think, can, can play. And then uh, we haven't done a lot of it, we, but we brought in a junior college transfer this year just because we have a lot of youth. Um, and a guy named Devin Collins, who's from uh, Colorado, and he played uh, at Dawson College, which is not the one in Quebec, but the one in uh, Montana. And they actually won the conference. And he was uh, an, all, an all-conference player there. So he's a 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, small forward. And he's just uh, a guy we haven't really had, a guy that can guard probably four positions, long, athletic. And, and uh, you know, he's just, he just does a lot of dirty work. And uh, he's very effective at it. And he's an outstanding personality. So we got some... Uh, just some different different types coming in. And we got a real international flavor on our team as it is. And SFU is like that. We're a big international school. So all these guys fit in really well. And then we uh, we signed another guy late, Paul Denenko, who's a real athletic 6'6 forward from Centennial. He, he's a guy who's come to our camps every year for three years. Got to see him play. And obviously he's been athletic for, for some time, but he uh, – he just needs to play against, you know, high level players every day because he's already a bit of a man. He's just got to just got to play some top level talent. I think his growth is going to be really huge at SFU. So, so those are our four recruits. And then uh, we're probably going to have a uh, that we'll announce a little later, but uh, that, you know, with uh, Joe Envelson getting the head coach job at UFB, there'll be some change at Douglas and, and, and Joe's taking some talent, the Douglas guys over to uh, UFB, but there's a couple local guys that I think uh, can help us up at SFU. So, 
So this year, yeah, we'll, we'll have a roster of about 14, 15 guys, and we'll probably have two red shirts and, uh, yeah, just compete. So we're, we're very excited. I mean, we graduated, you know, three big minute guys, you know, Othniel Spence, who was an outstanding three point shooter. And then Michael Hannon, who was our kind of our garbage man and, and shut down defender. So, but I, I think the guys filling these roles are going to be very good. So we're excited. Absolutely. Uh, just a couple last questions and then we'll get you out of here. The, you know, I, one of the things I, from, I've interviewed probably 20 coaches now on this thing and, and everyone's journey is, it's like this, it's crazy. It's like going in different directions and you're obviously a great example of that. Um, but then it, it, if you keep putting in the time, eventually it works out. Talk about a piece of adversity you got, you had to overcome to get to the place that you're at, um, which is, you know, Canada's team, as you guys market assignment. And then, you know, one of the top schools in the entire country. It's got to be pretty cool. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the NCAA piece is, is, is really unique. And um, I mean, the adversity, I mean, taking the job, I, I, I probably had about six or seven coaching colleagues reach out and just say, you got the toughest job in Canada. Um, you know, it, it's because a lot of people don't understand the levels in Canada, division one, two, and three. So at division three, you have close to 360 schools and they're all academic scholarships. There's no athletic scholarships. Division two that is allowed 10 full ride athletic scholarships and then D one, which is 13 full rides. So, um, but what's happening in D two right now is, you know, D ones used to play a lot of the D twos in the preseason, but now that's, that's seeming less and less. And that's a lot of D twos are, are beating some of these division one programs. So the level is really high. There's 315 D two teams versus 48 teams in, in U sport. So just the, the, the depth, um, you know, if you, if you look at the bottom of the 315, you, you have some lower end programs, but when you get into the middle and the top, you just have so much talent that you got to deal with. And, and, uh, you know, it's a big country. U S is a big country. So there's a lot of players. Uh, Arguably the best game I've ever watched personally. I watched Seattle Pacific play Western Washington. I don't know, maybe seven years ago uh, when they were one and two in the country. And, yeah, eight years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It was unbelievable. It was like, it was the best basketball I've ever seen in my life. The, the level of play was spectacular. And then Western Washington, I think, won the national championship that year. And then they went to Duke and only lost by 18. Like it was, it was, you know, so when people, people don't really get it, that's what we're talking about. We're talking 18. Duke probably beat 10 teams that year by 30 plus, And they only beat Western Washington by 18. So it's a, it's a serious league for sure. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it, it, looking back at, at the Fraser Valley North when, when we had those good Fox teams, I mean, it's a very, it, it's very similar thing. If you can get out of the GNAC um, and you have, you have some talent, you know, you, you can go far. So, and what tends to happen is all, all of the teams in the GNAC do really well in the preseason. They beat a lot of the other D2 programs. And then when we get into the conference, it's an ax, uh, absolute dogfight. So when you have the number one team lose to the number six team, that really affects their national ranking and how things work. So, but it's just how it is. I think a big part of it is the, the geographic region that we're in. There's a lot of travel, a lot of long travel. So, you know, we're, we leave uh, usually Wednesday afternoon and we're not getting home till Sunday morning. So it's, um, it, it's, it, it's a lot. So, you know, I know the Canucks always complain about their travel and, and I can see a little bit of that in what we have to do. Uh, just the recovery with sleeping away from home and stuff like that. But uh, I just think it makes us tougher. So uh, I'm excited for the challenge and, and, and keep working at trying to get us to a national championship. Absolutely. Uh, last question of the day. If you could go back and give young Steve Hansen, not that you're not young today, but the younger version of Steve Hansen, just a little bit of advice. What would you, what would you tell him to kind of help him along the way? <laughs> oh, man, there's, there, there's a lot of things. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean – I think looking back, you, uh, I mean, I, I'm really happy when I look back. So I think, I think a big part of it is, you know, take it all in, you know, you're, you're going to make a ton of mistakes as a young person and uh, you know, keep moving forward. You know uh, I had a friend ask me the same thing, you know, what, what would you change? And I said, you know, I, I I'm not big on changing just because you're going to learn from all those mistakes and those, those journeys. So I think just keep looking forward, you know, uh, keep that positive mind mindset and uh, learn from your mistakes and, and, and look for challenges all the time. I, th I think you learn so much from taking big challenges on 
And uh, that's really important, I think, for all young people is, is, is take on those big challenges, right? Do hard things, right? You learn, you learn from doing hard things, not, not taking the easy way. No, oh, and I think that's a fantastic piece of advice for everybody. Well, thanks a lot for joining us today, Steve. Very exciting. I'm excited to see your team play. Hopefully, we get some games this year and uh, life can slowly start to get back to normal. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anthony. Take care, buddy.